Hi there once again and welcome to another Expresso Mechanic tutorial. And in this one we're creating object identification using dynamic collisions. That's what we're about here. Now as you can see there's quite a few different things happening and we're going to be using a combination of Expresso and Python to achieve a lot of this. And we're also going to be making use of thinking particles because as you can see as each of the objects is struck by the sphere sparks are flying and we're using thinking particles to generate those. So yeah, a few different things to do within this tutorial, but it's nothing too scary and uh, should be quite fun. But anyway, that's what we're about in this tutorial. So without further ado, let's see if we can make this happen. We'll start by bringing in a cube and in the size X, we will make this 600, same in the Z, and 5 in the Y. So that gives us a starting point. We'll make this editable by hitting C, switch to polygon mode, and select the top polygon here. And what we'll do is hit I for in set, and we'll offset by 5. That will be fine. Apply this. And then we can hit UL to select loop selection. And we want this outer loop here. Then D for extrude and we'll offset by 20. And that gives us a tray for everything to sit in. So that's fine. That's all looking good. The next step is to bring in the objects that we want the sphere to crash into. We can bring in a cylinder, we'll make the radius 25 and the height 50. Just bring this up in the Y so that it's going to just about sit in the tray. I'll put a fillet on it for the sake of it. Let's just go into our caps and we'll fillet it by one centimeter to make it look that little bit nicer. We'll also switch the display to garage shading lines and isopalms. Place it somewhere around here. I mean, the placement is not, you know, not an exact science. You can place these things wherever you want. So we've got the cylinder. We'll move on from here. We'll bring in a torus. The ring radius will make 25. The pipe radius We'll try 10. I think that will be fine for that. Again, we can move this up so that it just about sits on the tray there. In fact, we'll switch to our right hand view. So F3, zoom in a little bit closer. Let's just see where this is. It just needs to raise up a little bit somewhere there. And the cylinder needs to move down a tad so let's just bring that down until it sits just about there switch back to our 3d view so f1 so we've got a couple of objects in let's bring some more in let's bring in a pyramid and we can make this 50 by 50 by 50 that's the pyramid brought in we can bring that up we'll push it somewhere over here Just switch to that right hand view. So F3 once again and make sure that we've got this sitting down just about on top of the tray. And then we can think about two more objects. So let's bring in a cone. We'll make it 25 in its bottom radius, 50 in its height. Let's bring it up here. F3 once again, just to make sure that we're where we need to be and we know that we need to bring it somewhere over here. Let's just drop that down there and let's see where we are. Yeah, we can bring it just a little bit further over somewhere here. And then finally, we'll bring in a platonic object and we'll make this 30 in its radius. Just raise it up and I'm going to use a dodecahedron and we'll take a look at this in our right hand view see where it is now we need to rotate it 
so that it sits properly so we just rotate that to there and then I'll switch to my world coordinates and just drop it down until it sits on the tray just about there okay great so we've got our objects in let's just move this somewhere over here I don't want them too precise so you know we can jiggle these around and just move them until they're a little bit offset something like that I think will be okay probably move that down a little bit to that way that looks okay that looks as if that's going to work okay for us so we've got our objects if we wish to we can color them we might as well do that we'll give them some colors just to distinguish them let's make this one a cyan blue the cylinder will make a green so we'll bring down the blue bring down the red the Taurus will make orange let's bring that down to there and somewhere there that'll do nicely the pyramid will make that yellow just make it a nice yellow color that's fine take the x-ray off that and finally the cone we can make this a pink just bring it down into there somewhere that'll do nicely okay so we've got five nicely colored objects and we're ready for our next step We'll bring in a sphere and make it 20 in the radius. And we'll color it red. OK, so we've got our sphere. The next thing to do is switch to our top view, so F2. And we can think about creating a spline path for the sphere to travel around. So let's get a hold of the spline pen and we'll start somewhere here. Put our first point. And this is very rough because we're going to be doing some work with it afterwards. We'll refine it, you know, and just make it a bit better than it actually is at the moment. really doesn't matter what it looks like and that'll do for our spline path and as I say we will do some refinement for it so we'll hit escape so we've got that ready the next thing to do with our sphere is give this if we look in our animation tags and a line to spline tag and the path will be our spline so that sets it there and then we can see that that's going to travel around there now at the moment it's missing each of the objects but we're going to make the sphere dynamic so we'll add a dynamics tag to this sphere rigid body from the bullet tags and it should be set up okay let's have a look and see where we are we, well we can switch that off because we we don't need to the inherit tag to apply to children because we've got no children individual elements we can switch that to off as well we don't need to worry about that so none for the inherit tag and individual elements off because we don't need to worry about the shape now we'll make that a convex hole and that should do fine for that and then in our forces tab here we'll set follow position to five because we want the although we want the, the sphere to be dynamic we do want it to try to follow this path when we actually animate the position of the aligned spline what i'm going to do is set my frames here for my timeline to 300 record at frame zero the position 0% on the 
a line to spline tag. And then we'll move through to the end, set this to 100% and record again. And let's just give this a run and see what happens. So we can see what is happening there. The, it's trying to follow, but it's, it's not quite able to, which is exactly what I want. I want the forces of inertia to be used in this. Now at the moment, it's not got any other dynamic objects to interact with. So it's it's falling through the bottom of the tray. You can see that that's happening. Now we don't actually want that. What we need to do in actual fact is move our spline. If we, in our tools here, go to the axis and axis center, we'll execute that so that we set the axis of the spline into the center of it and then we can move it up. It doesn't really matter where it goes. It can go you know, above by a fair way, actually. I mean, that, that sphere isn't touching the tray, and it doesn't matter because if we just leave it there, that will be okay. Because with the sphere being dynamic, if we play, we can see that it drops down anyway. Now, what we need to do is make the actual cube here a dynamic object so we'll do that first let's just give that a dynamics tag so it needs a collider body so we've got that in we'll leave where are we the collision the friction we can make probably about 30 we'll leave the bounce at 100 then let's just see what happens now so now we can see the sphere is rolling around the tray so that's great. It's it's on its way to working. Now, the, the one thing we do need to do in our windows here, if we go into the timeline F curve, we don't want this to be, let's just frame all. Now we can see it. We, we just want to select this and we want to make it linear. I think we'll use that in linear mode. It just gives us a better result. Okay, so we can see that the inertia is working. It's not following the spline perfectly. It's pretty much behaving the way we want, but it's not quite going to hit those objects yet. Now, the next thing we need to do with the objects, if we select all of them, so we'll just shift select the cylinder, and then option G to group them, we can call this objects. So we've got our objects grouped into a null. The objects null, I'm going to give a bullet collider body again. I'm going to give that a collider body tag. Once again, we can leave everything as it is, really. The friction bounce, we can just we can just leave them. It doesn't really matter. The apply to children and stuff, we can just we can remove that if we wish. We can do the same down here with the cube. Might as well do it just to take anything off that we really don't want. OK, so that's great. So everything there is fine. And we've got a group of dynamic objects. Now, if we switch to F, F, our, our top view, so F2, uh, and we take a quick look at what's going on in here. Right, so for a start, we need to bring our sphere, if we switch to point mode, we need to bring our, our sphere closer to this object. So the way to do it is to just make adjustments to our path. Just get it nice and close. So that we get it somewhere there. And again, over here, this is going to be too far away. Let's get, just get this closer. Something like that. And let's bring this, just adjust those slightly and bring this somewhere in here. Bring this over somewhere there. I would say that's quite nice. Something like that should work for that. And let's just get this closer as well. And the same here. Just bring that in there. Okay, let's tighten things up. This last point, we just need to soft interpolate the tangents. That's better. Yeah, I mean that's that's a lot better than that. Bring that over there somewhere. Something like that. OK, let's see what happens. Still not quite hitting that one.
Right, so the inertia, there's quite a lot going on with the inertia, isn't there? It's really making a huge difference. Let's just bring this closer. And you do have to do this, you know, you can't be quite sure where you need to put the points initially. It's a little bit of a trial and error thing, but so be it. It's just the way it is. We're working with dynamics. Let's see where we are now. Let's get this closer. Right, let's have another go. Make sure we're getting the actual. We're not actually getting collision, are we? Let's see why that is. Why are we not getting collision? We should be. Ah, I think I know why, actually. I should have apply to children on. Don't need individual elements, but I do need apply to children. Let's see what happens now. Ah, now we are. Yep, we're getting collision. Yep. Yep, we're getting collision. I th let's just check the cone. I just want to make sure I'm getting collision with that. Not quite, am I? Just that inertia is just throwing it around that corner so that it doesn't quite hit the cone. Oops, I don't want to do that so that it doesn't quite hit the cone. But I'm hitting there, hitting there, hitting there. Yeah, I think I am now. That's good. I think we're, we're there. Yeah. Yeah, so we're hitting every object. And that's what we need to do. We might actually be hitting the torus more than once. I only really want one hit on each object. So let's just bring that a little bit further away. That should do the job, I think. Let's just see. Yeah, it's hugging it, isn't it? It's just not quite what I want. I just want one glance on each object. Yeah, I think we're okay now. Great. For now, I'm going to call that done. So that's our path and our dynamics actually set up and doing what we want them to do. And you can, as I say, there's no exact science here. You can set this up however you like. But just try to set it up so that you just get a single glance off of each object when the sphere collides with each of them. That's what you're trying to aim for. But anyway, that's the dynamic side of this setup. And we can now think about moving on and doing some espresso. We'll bring in a null, call it espresso, give it an espresso tag. The window's open and we are ready to start work. The first thing to bring in, actually, is the all important dynamics collision node. So let's come down to bullet here and we'll bring in dynamics collision. Now, this is a very, very useful node, as we know, we have had a look at it before. At the input stage here, we don't need to worry about plumbing anything in. If we wish to, we could plumb in, say, the sphere and the platonic object. We could have these in these two fields here and it would only analyze collisions between those two objects. We want it to look at every object so we don't need to place anything in these two fields. We can leave that as it is and we also don't need to worry about the index here, the collision index. At the output stage we need to add a couple of extra ports. So we need to bring in a normal and we also need point A. We need those two and you will see why as things progress. But for now this is how you need to set the node up. Now the first thing that we need to do is bring in our objects null and connect point A or rather object A to an object port. And what this will allow us to do is pass the object that we've collided with to this objects node here. So this is powerful stuff. Now, if we give this at the output stage a name port, we can then think about bringing in a text spline. Bring one of those in. We'll just place it 
anywhere in the scene for now it doesn't matter but what we will do in the object tab here we'll change the font and I'm going to go for my usual font which is lemon milk pro which is I just happen to like and we'll set this to 20. perhaps we could go a little bit bigger than that but I think 20 will be fine because this is going to be floating above the object it's going to see it's just going to appear on the screen and then it will float up as we hit the objects so 20 I would say it's about right it's not a bad size we'll leave it where it is for now and then what we'll do is pull this in and just place it over here put this here and in the object properties we'll say text spline now at the moment it's reading objects and that's fine there's not a problem with that so let's just play through and straight away we're saying sphere it's it's registering the fact that the sphere is colliding with the cube. it's actually with the cube that's what it's registering so you can see how this works well, we of course want it to actually read the objects that we're colliding with so at the moment it's not quite doing what it's supposed to do but you can see that we're on the road to, to actually getting there so we'll unplug this for now and we'll leave it somewhere over here because this is going to be pretty much the last node in the chain but we're on the road the next thing that we need to actually bring in is going to be the all-important Python node because we're going to be doing quite a lot with that in this particular instance so let's just bring that one in come down to script bring in the Python node now at the moment we we can literally just get rid of all the ports and start from scratch and we need quite a few ports for this particular node first thing we need to bring in is going to be an integer we'll rename this port frame and you probably guessed that we're going to be using a time node so we'll bring that in now we might as well get that set up as per usual remove the time port and add a frame port and plumb the frame into the frame so that's our first port for our Python node set up and ready to go the next thing I'm going to do is bring in a string port and I'm going to name this name underscore in and plumb the output of this into here so we're going to be working with this inside the Python node the next thing to do is bring in a vector port and we will call this normal underscore in now we're going to be using this with this normal port but if we hit control here and just get the port information we can see that the type is a normal it's, it describes it as a normal it, it is actually a vector so we can plumb this into our normal in because of course we've got a vector there so these two are going to play well together so we can plumb that in there the next thing we need will be another integer and we will rename this one trigger now the trigger is going to be used with this count so I'm just going to move this down one and we're going to plumb that in there because our count value this count registers the number of hits that have been made on any given object okay that's what that does and it could be a large number it could be you know, it could be anything between zero and well almost any any number it just depends how many times you collide with an object but every time an object collides with another object it does register a hit so that's that part of it sorted out moving on from here we need three more ports and they all need to be floats so I'm just going to bring them in and then we'll rename them and they need to be renamed as follows and this will be x underscore in 
and this one will be y underscore in and finally you've probably guessed it it will be z underscore in so we've got those set up and you'll see why i'm using those very shortly moving on from here we need to do the output stage and again we need quite a number of ports the first thing is a vector we'll just make things slightly bigger we'll rename this one normal underscore out the next one will be an integer and this one will be emit the next one will be another integer and it will simply be called on a string and we'll rename this one name underscore out and then we need another three floats so once again I'll bring them all in and then we can rename them accordingly and this will be pos underscore x pos underscore y and once again pos underscore z and that is our python node well and truly set up so everything is there and it's all ready to go and we've already got some outputs from various nodes here plumbed into it great so moving on from here then we can think about doing a little bit of python coding but before we actually start producing the code let's just fix this issue with the objects not showing up correctly let's plumb the name out put port into the text spline once again and then to fix this problem because as you remember we ran the sequence and we weren't getting the objects registering what we need to do is click on here in the shape we need to change this to moving mesh and if we go back to the start of the animation and play now we can see that we get cylinder torus we've got a bit of an issue there pyramid cone just about and we also got platonic just about so we need to do a little bit of adjustment here and there just to get this working exactly as we want it to but we've got our objects registering and that's important because the code wouldn't work properly if we didn't do that so that's all good fantastic so let's switch to a scripting layout open our expression once again click on the python node and open in editor and we're ready to start work and we can just take away this line 10 for the moment and right let's see where we go from here so normal out then that refers to our normal out here that's an output we can then start adding some more uh, global variables we can start with on which again relates to this on here start underscore time and if you haven't guessed we are going to be using a monoflop we then want pos underscore x pos underscore y pos underscore z and that takes care of these three we also want x and z and you'll see what they're used for a little bit later title name out so that takes care of this one and vector and finally we want emit so we've got a number of variables in there in fact I have missed one I also need bool I'll just put that on the end bool so that's all of our variables or global variables dealt with 
OK, fantastic. So we've got it that far. Moving on from here, we can say if frame is equal to zero. So whatever's coming in from this time node into here. When we're at zero, we want something to happen. We need to define our variables or a few of our variables. So we can say bool is equal to zero. Start underscore time is equal to zero. Now in times past, I would have done that. We're not going to be doing that anymore because I've been educated since our last meeting with Python and I'm not going to be using that technique anymore. There's a much better way of doing it. This is a much more efficient way of doing it. Uh, but anyway, it's all a learning curve. I'm a student too. We can then say title is equal to and it will be an empty string. So just two single quotes. Vector is equal to and this will be C4D dot vector and it will be bracket zero, comma zero, comma zero. And that's all we need in there, just a, an empty vector or a, a vector that's zeroed out, basically. And then finally, we need x is equal to zero and z is equal to zero. And that gives us the first little part of our code. So we're set up with everything zeroed out, basically, of frame zero, which is exactly what we need now. And next port of call is to check what's going on with this trigger input here. So if this is if we've been triggered, we want something to happen. Now, the way we do that is to say if trigger and it will be is greater than or equal to three. So if the count has registered three or more hits, then we want something to happen. And we can also say and because we, we need two conditions to make this happen. We can say name underscore in is equal to or rather not equal to I beg your pardon. So exclamation mark equal to not equal to single quotes and it will be cube. So we don't want this dynamic object to be included. We don't care about the sphere hitting that. So we can then put a colon on the end and we can think about the next part. We then need to actually load these variables up. So we can say if bool is less than one, bool is equal to one. If start time is less than one, start underscore time is equal to, and it will be frame. So we're going to grab whatever our current frame is from the timeline and put it in start time. If title is equal to an empty string, just put a colon on the end of there. We can then say title is equal to and it will be name underscore in. So whatever's coming out of here into name in, that's what we want when we've been triggered. If x, and on this occasion I'm going to say is less than 0.1, x is equal to, and it will be x underscore in. We can then copy this, paste it in here, and change the x's into Z's. Oops, that's better. OK, so that deals with X and Z. And then finally, we've got to deal with vector. So if vector is equal to, and it will be this, we can then say vector is equal to, and it will be normal underscore in. So don't worry too much about what Vector is doing at the moment. It will become clear when we start using thinking particles. But that completes those two parts of the code. We now need another if. So we're going to look at bool. 
if bool is equal to one and we know that it will be when we've been triggered because we've set it up we can then say duration is equal to and it will be frame minus start time we can then say if duration and it will be less than three emit is equal to one we can then put an else in here and say emit is equal to zero Again, this will be used with our thinking particles. So at the moment it's redundant, but it will be used a little bit later. We can then worry about a range mapper. So we can then say if duration is less than 30. Range underscore mapper is equal to c4d.utils.range map brackets duration 0 comma 30 for our input range so our time from our duration we can then say 50 comma 150 for our output range and we'll just put true on the end I'm not going to use a spline. We could define one, but not really worth it, I don't think, on this occasion. So I'm not going to be bothering with using one. If you want to, you can always set one of those up as a user data and pull it in. But anyway, let's continue from here. So we can say pos underscore x is equal to x. So whatever we've grabbed in here, and that will be the current position or the current hit position along the x-axis basically now we can then say pos underscore y that will equal range mapper because as I said what I want my lettering to do when, when this is when there's been a hit I want the text spline here to jump to the point of the hit so that will be along the x and z axes but the y we're going to animate because we're going to make it rise up so that's what we're doing here Finally, we can just copy this code, drop it in here, and change the x's for z's. So that's got that sorted out. Moving on from here, let's have a look and see what we've got. We can say on is equal to one. Name underscore out is equal to title and finally normal underscore out is equal to vector okay so that's fine that sorts all of that out the on and the normal out they're both going to be used with the thinking particles once again so they'll come into play a little bit later we can then say else and it will be bool is equal to zero start underscore time is equal to zero x is equal to zero z equal to zero title equal to an empty string once again vector is equal to and once again we need to copy our code here let's copy that paste it in there on is equal to zero pos underscore x equal to zero and again copy this code paste it in here put a y where the x is and finally a z where the x is so that's got those all sorted out and finally normal 
underscore out can now be equal to normal underscore in. So that resets our normal. Fantastic. Now to finish off completely, we just need to say else at this level on is equal to zero. Emit is equal to zero. Once again, all of these can be copied, pasted in here, because we want those to be zeroed at all other times when we're not doing stuff in here or in this particular piece of code here. And then finally, we need to just do a couple more. So again, it will be normal in, or rather normal out is equal to normal in, and then the final piece of code will be name out. So now name out, we can simply say is equal to an empty string. So that's our code. That's as much as we need to do in order to make the code actually do what we want it to. So it's not hugely complex, just a, quite a few different globals here but many of them do relate to the outputs or well, seven of them are relating to the outputs. so there's quite a bit that we have to just do there and just a few variables um, you know there's not a huge number of variables but we just need to initialize them set them up at the correct time with their in their statuses there and then process the data that we get from there using this next piece of code here that's all it is. It's really quite simple. And the most complex part of it is just the range mapper. But yeah, that's all there is to it. It's, it's quite a simple piece of code, really. Before I move on, I've noticed there's another variable I need to work with here. I need to say name underscore out is equal to, and it will be an empty list in there. I just needed to put that one in. I'd forgotten it there. Let's have a look through, see if I've made any syntax errors anywhere. It could be. Let's just execute the code, actually. That's not telling me anything, so I, nothing's coming up in there. Let's have a look. I've typed one of the double equals here. Ah, and another one there. Double equals. That's important. So less than, less than, double equals. That's correct. And less than, less than, double equals. Yep, that looks as if it's okay. Yeah, that looks fine. Yeah, I think everything's OK. Anyway, the interpreter will tell me if there's any more errors, but it looks as if I've got everything OK. Fantastic. So we're ready to move on from here and do a little bit more with the Espresso. I think we'll come back into a standard layout for this. Just bring this back in. And we're ready to start moving on. We need to work with our text spline. So we'll bring this a little bit closer. Now, we need a couple more ports at the input stage. In our basic properties, we need enabled. We'll place that one at the top. Let's just make that bigger. Place that one at the top. We also need global position. So we'll bring that in. And that completes the setup for our text spline. Now, the on port from our Python node, we can plumb in to the enabled. We'll plumb that in there. The name out can be plumbed into the text spline. And then to deal with the position, we need to bring in a reels to vector. And we can plumb the outputs of all of these into these and then plumb this into the global position. Now, the moment we're getting a yellow top on the Python node, let's just see what's going on. See if anything works. Just play this here. Right. OK, so we've definitely got something going on in the Python node. Let's go back to a scripting layout. Select our Python node and open 
in editor. Let's see what we've got. So it says at line 23, we've got an issue. Okay, so we've got to set a colon on the end of there. We just need to take that away. Let's go back to the beginning. We've got trigger not defined. I'm not too worried about that. I've seen that before. It's not true. So let's see what happens if we play. Right, we've got, where are we? Duration is not defined. Okay, we, yeah, I've, I've spelt something wrong. So let's have a look. Right, here we go. Let's just take this and spell it correctly. We just don't need that there. Always a syntax error, bound to be. Let's have a go, see what we get now. Right, now we're starting to get something working. Yeah, we've got too many hits, but you can see that it's working. It is actually doing its job. So this is all good. There's no yellow top on it anymore. That's fine. Let's just go back to the standard layout. Right, so at the moment... Right, we just get... OK, it, it is doing what it should be doing, but it's not quite right. The reason I think... Let's have a look at this. Yeah, OK, the same thing. The shape for this cube object needs to be a moving mesh as well. Didn't do that earlier. I should have done that earlier. Let's see what happens now. And now we get cylinder. We get torus. Pyramid. Cone. And platonic. So that is now doing what it should be doing. And the next thing we can do, actually, we'll just place this into an extrude. And in the object tab here, we'll just make the offset one. And we'll also color this. We'll make it a nice blue, so somewhere like that. That'll be okay, I think, with that. Let's see what happens now. And there we go. We've got cylinder, torus, pyramid, cone, and platonic. So they're all doing what they should be doing. That's working fine. So there's no more problems with the code that's doing its job. Fantastic. So we can think in terms of creating the sparks next with our thinking particles. Let's get the editor open again and we can start doing some more work. So the first thing I'm going to bring in will be a P storm. So I'll come down to my thinking particles and we want a generator and it needs to be a P storm. So we've got that in. At the moment, we've only got the emitter position at the input stage. We want also an on port and we want emitter alignment. Let's just get these sorted out. So we want the alignment in the middle and, or rather the alignment at the top and we want the position in the middle. Now, the emitter will actually be controlled by the emit output port that will be plumbed into the on the emitter position will be point a from the dynamics collision now the alignment that needs to be controlled by the normal out now if we just click on here and get our port information we can see that this is a vector but if we do the same over here we've got a matrix here. So we've got a bit of an issue that we need to fix. So we need to convert a vector value to a matrix. And we can do that by grabbing in a node which will allow us to do it. And that will be vector to matrix. So we'll bring one of those in. We can plumb this into the input and this into the P storm and now they'll play well together. So that sets everything up there. Now the P storm we need to set up in order to make it work correctly. We want it in shot mode. Our shot value needs to be 100. Our life will make 60 frames. We'll also add a variation of 100.
Our speed will make 300 with a variation of 50%. I'm gonna lower the size down because these are sparks. I'll just make the size four. Size variation, I'll make 50%. And our X FOV, I will make 180. And I'll do the same for the Y FOV, 180 for both of those. The size is 20 centimeters in both directions. So the X size and the Y size make those both 20. And everything else I'm going to leave as it is. So that's our P-Storm set up so far. Now let's see if we actually get anything. And we, you can see that we do. We're getting probably too many sparks really. But it looks pretty impressive, doesn't it? <laughs> that's probably a bit too many. But it's pretty darn impressive. Uh, if we just lower our shot value we've got a hundred in there we just need to make that 10. let's just do that at 10 and now let's see what we get that's a bit better okay so that's giving us a nice shower of sparks when we hit and you can see that they're aligned correctly because they're showering off at the correct angles and that's because we put the emitter at the correct position and also at the correct normal angle or the, the correct angle of rotation based upon the normal value that's coming out of our Python node. So that's all working really nicely. Now, it isn't quite finished though, because we need for a start a P-pass node. We bring one of those in. So our thinking particles, we can just collect a P-pass from here. It has all in the group, but the best thing to do is come into simulate here thinking particles TP settings and grab a hold of this and bring it in here. Now the color we don't really need to worry too much about but we can set it up with a color we can make them a sort of orangey color so that they're like sparks that'll do initially. So we've got our P pass the first thing that we can do is bring in a P gravity so We'll bring in a dynamic P gravity. OK, and at the moment it's saying none in there. And the reason for that is because we need to bring a null in and name it gravity. And we also, well, we'll, we'll plumb it into there first. Just drop this gravity into here. That's created a gravity object. If we just bring that up, we can see that if we look at from here, that the gravity direction is currently along well, it's going to be moving along the Z axis anyway, but it's if we look at it in terms of where we are, we're not going to be moving, you know, we're going to be moving backwards through the scene. We don't want that. We need to move it downwards. So we need to rotate the gravity object around its rotation P. And if we hold down the shift key and rotate, we can make that minus 90 degrees. So we've rotated that into the correct place to make this work. So if we just go back to zero and run the sequence now, let's see what we're getting. Are we getting any gravity in there? Not at the moment, are we? Oh yes, we might be, I don't know. Um, doesn't seem to be doing what it's supposed to be doing uh, because we haven't connected these two let's connect those two up and see what happens let's do that yeah and we are we can see that they're spraying out and they are getting pulled down at least i think they are we might need to do some work with the gravity node let's have a look see what we've got strength 100 planar gravity decay we've got zero it should should be okay. I don't think we need to really do anything in there, but let's just have a look at this and see where we are. Just move it up. Yes, they are being pulled down. At the moment, though, they're spraying out a little bit too much, and we need to add some friction. So that will be the next node that we bring in.
we'll bring in the friction node. Just move this down a little bit, place it at the top. Now the friction, I'm going to set a value of three and connect it to the P-pass. And let's see what happens now. That's a bit better. That's reined it in and we can see that they're falling nicely with the gravity. Yeah, I think we can settle for that. Now the only other thing we need to bring in is a deflector. So we'll bring one of those in, connect this up. Now the deflector object needs to be the cube. We'll just place that in there. And the deflector type we need to set to object. And let's see what happens now. Now we can see that they're bouncing along the f when they hit the cone. That or rather the cube. That's really nice. That's giving us the result that we want. Just play that through. Yeah. I mean, they don't have a long life, but they do actually bounce off the cube when they hit it. And that's really nice. Great. That's fantastic. Now, the only other thing you can do, if you wish, is to bring in a P-shape. So let's just bring in one of those. P-shape bring that into there. Now in order to get this to work we need particle birth and we can just bring that in here and connect that to the p-shape. Now at the moment we've got none in there because we need an object. Now I brought in another sphere. We need to make it a lot smaller. Um, if we make that sphere something like one centimeter. Just place it into the scene. And then we also need to bring in a P geometry or TP geometry. And the particle group, once again, we can come into our thinking particle settings and drag the all into the particle group. Now, I also created a material and in the color, I simply made it something like this. Just wants to be something like that. It's brightness, it can, it can be more bright if we wish to make it slightly brighter. Or you can even add luminance, of course, uh, if, if you wish to. But for what it is, I'll just give it a color uh, and we'll drop that onto the TP geometry. And let's just take this back to our start position. Let's just see what we're getting. Now, at the moment, we're not really seeing anything. We probably need to do some adjustment in our TP shape here. We've got, we've got to bring an object in. Let's just drop the sphere into there. Let's just see how we go with that. See if we've got anything at all in there. We don't appear to be getting anything, but it might be because things are slightly too small. And I think it's probably because of this round bounding radius. If we set that to zero, we should start to see something then hopefully let's see, have a look see what we get yeah and we can see that we are we're getting objects in there now okay that's great yeah that's okay and we're getting variations in sizes because I've placed that in you can see that this one is a lot smaller than these so that's okay that's doing the job for us and giving us what we need Yeah, and there you go. So that is how you go about creating this and making it work.
So yeah, that's looking really quite nice. And that just about completes this tutorial because I've got it set up and it's behaving exactly the way I want it to. So yes, it's not too difficult. You just need a few nodes and a bit of Python and some thinking particles. And that makes the whole thing work. So yeah, I mean, the dynamics collision is the thing that's driving all of this. That's the, the really cool node here. That's the one that's giving us everything that we actually need in order to make the whole setup work because it's driving the emitter position and a number of other things within this Python node. So yeah, it's, it's just a simple combination of four different aspects of procedural animation, really. You need Espresso, a bit of Python, you need some thinking particles, and of course, some dynamic objects. But yeah, that's how you make the whole thing hang together, and uh, it's all pretty cool. And it goes to show you just how powerful Cinema 4D really is when you combine a number of different technologies within it. Fantastic. So yeah, that just about brings us to the end of this tutorial. And as always, I really hope you've enjoyed doing this one. And if you have, then please give the video a like. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, leave a comment and of course, ring the bell. And wherever you happen to be on social media, then please, please do share this video because all this good stuff really does help keep the channel moving in the right direction. But anyway, that just about brings the curtain down on this one. So I'll see you very soon on the next tutorial.